Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. The author Barbara Ehrenreich died earlier this month. If you don't know, she was an absolute beast at dismantling the phoniest aspects of our capitalist, profit-driven society. Probably her best-known book is Nickel and Dime from 2001. For it, she lived as a low-wage worker to see if it was really possible to make ends meet on that kind of paycheck. So she took house cleaning jobs and waitressing jobs and lived in crappy apartments, all to document the impossible bind that low-wage workers find themselves in. After the book came out, she spoke to NPR's John Idsty, who asked her, like, what can we do about this? You know, like, how can we help people in poverty? And the answers she gives are kind of frustrating. Not because they're bad answers, they're noble, almost predictable answers. It's just, I'm not sure how much progress we've really made on that front since the book came out. At the end of the new book, Nickel and Dimed, Barbara Ehrenreich writes, It is common among the non-poor to think of poverty as a sustainable condition. Austere, perhaps, but poor people get by somehow. What is harder for the non-poor to see is poverty as acute distress. Ms. Ehrenreich got closer than most of the so-called non-poor to understanding what getting by somehow actually means in the United States. She took a series of low-wage jobs, waitressing in Florida, for example, cleaning houses in Maine, and working at a Walmart in Minnesota. And what she experienced and wrote about, she calls a state of emergency. Barbara Ehrenreich joins us here in the studio. Welcome. Oh, glad to be with you. Why did you decide to do this project? Well, I thought it was a project that should be done. Uh, I was talking to Louis Laugh, I'm the editor of Harper's, and in the course of the conversation, I said, you know, some journalists ought to go out and do the old-fashioned kind of journalism and just try living on entry-level wages. Uh, I, I had in the back of my mind welfare reform and mothers of young children being kicked out into the workforce rather suddenly. How are they going to make it on 6 7 even $8 an hour? Anyway, the editor of Harper said, it should be you. <laughs> and there I was, stuck. I talked my way into it, and it went from being an article to uh, becoming a, a book. And you had some ground rules for yourself. The rules I made was seemed simple enough to stick to when I started out. Uh, one was that I you know, had to find the cheapest place to live in that I could. And two was that I had to take the best paying job that I could find. And uh, my third rule was that I had to really do my best. No fooling around on these jobs. That I had to, you know, that I couldn't screw up in any, in any way. That I really had to see what it would be like if you were actually trying to survive on these wages. Let's talk about the challenges you've, you faced in each of these jobs. Tell us a little bit about them. Well, I was expecting physically challenging work. I was expecting that it would be hard manual labor. It was harder even than I had expected in some cases, Uh, just a little more intense than I'd bargained on. Particularly the waitressing, I think. Well, waitressing, but you know, the hardest job physically was the house cleaning job. Mm -hmm. This was a, a house cleaning service. You work in a team, and this was under intense time pressure. You know, we had so many minutes per house, and and that was a very physically damaging job. Mm -hmm. I I want to add one thing I was not expecting in any of these jobs is that I was going to be mentally challenged, too. It is not that easy. Every job had a whole lot to master. My Walmart job was particularly taxing because I had to constantly memorize the changing layout of the ladies' wear department so I know exactly where each one of several thousand items had to had to go. So I no longer speak of any job as unskilled. Actually, jobs seem to be relatively plentiful, right? Uh, yeah. But some of the other uh, uh, parts of living the low-wage life were a challenge, particularly finding a place to live. Yes. Now, I didn't know this was going to be so difficult when I set out. I lived in in some places that were pretty creepy, uh, but also terribly expensive. Like in uh, Key West, I ended up in a a half-size trailer. That's a really teeny tiny trailer. But the rent was $625 a month. $625 a month for it. Yeah. And that didn't include utilities. And you have to have air conditioning there in the summer. I mean, you can't be in a little metal enclosure without it. Even worse, though, to my complete surprise, was the Twin Cities area, where I thought, this is going to be a breeze. It's an old blue-collar town. Well, 
there was no housing. I mean, there were literally no apartments for under uh, 800 or 1,000 a month. You know, and another barrier I discovered is that if you don't have that first month's rent and security deposit, which can be, you know, 1000 or more dollars, that's a huge amount of capital, then you're really, really stuck. And I ended up in a couple of places living in residential motels and feeling, wait, there's something wrong here. I'm, I'm not supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to be working, you know. <laughs> this is not part of the plan. But that is really how a lot of low-wage people live and pay exorbitant rents. Well, in know. fact, you you lived in the worst hotel in the world in well, somewhere the, the in Well, the worst motel Saint in Paul. the United States. In the United States. Well, all right. <laughs> um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, it was uh, dirty. Uh, the sewage backed up in the, from the toilet. There was not a real lock on the, I mean, there was a little lock, but no bolt, no no shade on the window. So I was, I was actually scared at night. And, you know, there I was, you know, paying much more than I was earning just to be there. But I would point out, I was living in relative luxury compared to the other people in that motel, because I had a room to myself. And most people in these residential motels will have a whole family crammed into one room. To what extent were you in this kind of condition because you had simply arrived in town, no real family or personal connections, and so you were kind of forced into this by your own ground rules? Uh, yeah. I mean, most low-wage workers are putting together, uh, you know, a couple will put together, share their earnings to pay rent, or you have adult children, or even teenage children can contribute. But people's housing arrangements fall apart real easily. Say you're crammed in with another family, and tensions develop. Well, there you are, out in the street. Or you flee an abusive mate. Or you miss rent enough times and get evicted. So I, I First, I thought mine was a very artificial situation. I began to realize it wasn't that artificial, really. Tell us a little bit about the people you met. Give us a few by name. I mean, you you name them in the book. They're not their real names. For instance, in in Maine, one of the most interesting and difficult stories uh, was was Holly. Yeah, Holly uh, was a rather young woman in her mid-20s at the latest, and uh, was sick. I mean, visibly sick. And in addition to being sick, she hurt her ankle very badly. And she really didn't want to lose the rest of the day's pay. I did get her to to call the boss. And of course, he just said, work through it. That was his motto. Uh, So there I was, completely furious, but also so helpless. And so this young woman cleaned the house, hopping around on one foot. And, the you know, you have to face there is that that $24 or that $30 she was going to make in the rest of the day was for her more important than her health. What do you think it is that keeps people like Holly in these jobs? I mean, in this case, it seemed that Holly had this sort of strange loyalty to the boss, the guy who was uh, asking her to continue to work on an injured ankle. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of loyalty. I mean, almost everybody I worked with was very dedicated to their jobs and doing a good job. But what keeps somebody there, um, there's an element of getting trapped. You know, I mentioned the sort of housing trap. In in a lot of jobs, too, you don't control your hours. So you might say, I'd like to go to night school. But then your your shift gets changed, and suddenly you're working nights. So, you know, they're, they're, you can get stuck real easy. What's to be done about it? There are many things, you know, that the public sector could be doing and hasn't been doing and probably won't be doing in the next four years. Health insurance for people that isn't tied to the job and that's just sort of automatic if you're a citizen. Women need child care, not only women. I mean, parents need uh, child care that's subsidized and that's high enough quality that you're not a wreck all the time over how your kids are being taken care of. I think we need more living wage campaigns you know, like the kind of thing that Harvard students and workers were recently campaigning for. And, the, you know, we've got to revise the definition of poverty, which is so out of date and does not reflect um, housing cost inflation. A lot of things. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Barbara Ehrenreich's book is Nickel and Dime. <laughs>